Welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Ida Shin. I'm a food program manager here at Google in the Bay Area and your host today. Please join me in welcoming today's guest, best-selling cookbook author and founder of the popular website Hot for Food All Day, Lauren Toyota. Lauren is the author of Vegan Comfort Classics 101 Recipes to Feed Your Face, love that title, and she's been named one of Canada's most influential vegans by Impact Magazine and has appeared on multiple national television programs sharing her expertise in making vegan food fast, fun, and delicious. Lauren's YouTube channel, Instagram, and website, Hot for Food, have amassed millions of views and a devoted fan base. Today, we'll be discussing Lauren's latest cookbook, which was recently released March 16th, Hot for Food All Day, as well as demonstrating a featured recipe from the book. Lauren, thank you for joining us. Hi, Ida, so excited. Oh. Not more than me. I'm no. so excited. Um, and as I, I had mentioned to you before, my daughter, who was a vegan for five years, was like beyond, um, like I, I rose a level in her eyes because I got to <laughs> interviewing you today. But it's funny, uh, my youngest is a vegan and my oldest is a, a diehard carnivore. And she was looking at the books that I have behind me and started earmarking just recipe after recipe and saying, these look delicious, we have to eat them. I was like, oh, great, your sister and I'll be happy to make them for you. And she stopped, kind of like did the what? Double take <laughs> and said, these are vegetarian. I was like, no, these are vegan. And she's like, I could go vegan after looking at these recipes and the, the beautiful photos. Um, and I was That's just amazing. wondering, do you get that a lot? or? I get it enough that it proves what I'm doing is working. It's what I set out to do. I really wanted people to look at the food I was posting on social media, really, and not know that it was vegan and just know that it was really good food that just happened to be made from plants. And so that's what I tried to show on my blog and then my YouTube channel. So I do get feedback like that, like that, that's similar or from people saying that they've managed to feed a bunch of my recipes to their partners or their parents, kind of unknowingly feeding them vegan food and then telling them afterwards. And so I always promote this kind of tricking. It's positive tricking. It's not negative tricking. So <laughs> I'm all for it. Well, you know, and in your newest book, you have a bring your own vegan dish to a potluck. Yeah. Uh, was that from your own experience or did you realize that when you brought these amazing vegan dishes that you could share your love of um, this style of food? It was definitely both. It was that I was going to Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter dinner at my family's house. And other than actually nothing would be vegan because even the <laughs> mashed potatoes, I had to teach them how to make mashed potatoes without like every dairy product in it so yeah there was almost pretty much nothing i could eat even like the salad would have bacon chunks in it and cheddar cheese shreds so i was having to bring my own stuff um and i don't mind doing that because i want to eat well anyways but i also at the same time like you said want to share that love and show people and it always ends up being because my dishes are so different because they, they make the same things every year so everyone knows the menu it never changes it only changes <laughs> if i bring some stuff and then everyone talks about that instead which is totally the situation you want to put yourself in so that you're not having to answer the kind of the weird awkward questions about being vegan but you just get to talk about food which i think is the perfect entry point to having a, a positive conversation and planting that seed for people amazing yeah now i have a question did you yeah. ever bring a dish and then not get enough for your own meal almost but i always make sure i take a portion first okay. and then i learned my lesson i think after the first 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 or second time of that oh i better just make more because people always yeah they're always like what's that i want some of that like it just ends up being the talk of the entire dinner which i'm all, that's amazing to me well yeah and your food is definitely a feast for the eyes i mean the colors the textures everything so i can i can see how people be especially on thanksgiving where the food yeah. can kind of be monochromatic your yes. food is just you know it's so vibrant and I'm sure the Thank flavors uh, from what I've had are, are just as vibrant. Um, yeah, I mean, I do that on purpose. I try to, I do think about what's the end plated thing gonna look like, right? Yeah. So that it does draw you in just by looking at it. 
All right. Um, in your first book, you uh, have a quote that I just loved. Anything you can mm -hmm. eat, I can eat better and vegan. Um, is that kind of like a mantra that you live by and you want <laughs> others to, <laughs> to embrace? Yeah, it, I think it's a good quote because it shows my my little bit of uh, my little bit of sass um, that I have that I think if you watch my YouTube channel, people that really watch a lot of the videos know that I have a little bit of a a little bit of a bite to my word sometimes. And I think it's acceptable sarcasm that I that I have. I'm a Scorpio, so it can't <laughs> help but come out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just feel like since I've been vegan, I've been doing this now for I'm going on 11 years. It's like, everything I eat is so much better than what I used to eat uh, as an omnivore and it's vegan. And so I just am really trying to prove to people that it's not a sacrifice or a deprivation or anything like that, that it's actually quite abundant. And I would say even more satisfying. Yeah. And, and so versatile because yes. um, I think people assume vegans can eat just like a salad. And, it, mm -hmm. and you have proven, no, you can have like this really indulgent, delicious, messy sandwich, um, right? That any burger place could, you know, could rival any burger place uh -huh. and, and be yeah. even more healthy and, mm -hmm. and just as delicious or even well, more delicious and, in my opinion. Yeah. And like we can eat salads, but it's yeah. also like there's an art to making a good salad, right? And that's also you know, I love eating salads, but they just have to be made a certain way. Like just doing, you know, a plain lettuce salad with tomatoes and cucumbers is not going to cut it. And then a lot of people will think, oh, well, I'll just put a piece of chicken on this and my meal is complete. But to me, that even seems so boring. It's like, then once you use plant-based ingredients and you're looking for plant-based proteins and plant-based protein combos, things just become so much more interesting and textural and all of that. Speaking of combos and, yeah. um, you know, making a, a beautiful salad. Uh, you had mentioned in your first book how it was not going to be, a, you wouldn't have a <laughs> bowl recipe, right? Because there were <laughs> yeah. plenty of recipes, vegetarian and, and vegan ones out there that focused on that Buddha bowl concept. But in your new book, you actually have a, a whole section called the bowl Bible. And I think you're, you have about 15 ingredients between five, yeah, you know, five bases, five toppings, and five like more hearty things, right? Five mm -hmm. vegetables. Um, if you take away just and make it only one base of, okay. the, of the choice, um, the com combinations of, in, you know, unique combinations, you can have 462 unique combinations of your bowls. And I love that you did that and <laughs> I didn't think of ever doing that. <laughs> I just was like, these are so many combinations. I didn't actually do the math. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that's what people, you know, it's like, it's so if to, to your recipes, if mm -hmm. you create these as master recipes and have them in your, in your refrigerator, just for, for prepping sake, right? Yeah. You could have 462 different meals for out the whole week or month. Yeah. And um, if you were to do repeats of your favorites and extras, you could have over 3,000 combinations. And so four, I love that. 460 is more than in one, one day a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's more than the whole year. That's so cool. Not to mention, that's only six pages of the book, right? The book's right. got uh, 100, over 120 recipes. So I've got people covered for the next decade of their life. I think so. What you're saying. <laughs> right. And especially with the way that your book has been um, organized this time mm -hmm. is that you have these recipes with an exclamation point, your like master recipes, and then you use them in other recipes to create more so that you don't want to reuse and repurpose, but in a way that it's so refreshing. It's not the same thing. It's not a leftover. You are really just creating something different. And you're going to show us something like that today, right? Yes. Yes. Thank you for pointing that out. Because I call it level up your leftovers, because you'll make a pot of soup, we're actually going to make the green pea soup today. And that'll give you, you know, four servings or five servings, but you may not want to eat green pea soup for four days in a row. And so how can you take the green pea soup and make it different for the next meal? And so this is a really simple level up leftover where we're kind of doing two variations of the soup with different uh, toppings. But throughout the book, I've got some other recipes as well that you level up. I also have um, 
like a base mac and cheese, one pot mac and cheese, and then five variations on that. So five flavorful variations like Tex-Mex mac and cheese, red Thai curry mac and cheese, uh, green mac and cheese that has pesto and all kinds of green things similar to this dish. Um, so you'll find there's a lot of uh, use of the same ingredients, but in very different ways as well, because I feel like I'm, I kept in mind, what are people purchasing? So to make sure they use up the fresh herbs that week, right? Or use up the arugula they bought in another dish. And so I'd really tried to keep all of this in mind, trying to make things a little easier for people as opposed to my first book, which is also why I did include the bowl Bible. I know I said, oh, you're not going to get plain old grain bowls in the first book because that first book was meant to be this like banging through the door, like impressive, <laughs> epic comfort food book. But this book, I really wanted to take the feedback I was getting from the audience too, of like, what are some easier meals? What are some one pot meals? As well as this concept of leveling up leftovers that I had been doing for years on the channel. Just, I used to cook off the cuff and just make up stuff with my leftovers for people. And they really liked that. And that's the feedback I've gotten is that's how I've taught people how to cook, right? To get more intuitive, to understand how to just kind of not follow any rules and really just try things. That's how you learn how to combine flavors and ingredients and kind of build your own repertoire of preferences as well. Awesome. Yeah. And you don't know what you like until you taste it sometimes. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So we are going to make green pea soup. And this recipe came from the fact that I did test out a split pea soup recipe. I used to like, um, this Habitant pea and ham soup growing up, which was kind of gross and looks like snot, but I used to like that. And I wanted to make a split pea soup recipe, but when I made my version, it tasted good, but it looked awful. And I thought, I can't put this in this cookbook. Like the colors are gross. It's not gonna photograph well. And so you do think about that, right? As you're creating this collection of recipes or this body of work, which is what a cookbook really is, you're trying to make sure that they all sort of speak to each other. And to me, the split pea soup just didn't fit. So definitely I, not the right Pantone color for the rest yes, of your food. <laughs> yes, yes. I wanted something brighter and fresher. And so I thought, well, I love fresh peas, like just throwing these on salads and in pastas and in mac and cheese. I do it all the time. So I thought, well, let's just make a whole soup made from peas with fresh herbs and uh, make it really tasty. So this is perfect uh, for spring really coming up and you can use frozen peas if you can't find fresh peas. I'm actually using frozen peas um, and I just had them thaw overnight. Uh, if you didn't think of thawing them overnight in the fridge, all you have to do is boil a kettle of water and just pour some warm water over this and they'll thaw in a couple of minutes and then you can just drain them through a sieve and they're ready to go. So this makes for a pretty easy dinner as well. Right? Yes, this one's very easy. Yeah, it comes together very quickly. Um, so I'm just heating my stock pot here over medium heat. I'm going to go up a little higher because I didn't turn it on uh, <laughs> soon enough. <laughs> and we're going to add uh, just a little bit of olive oil down here. And we're going to start by sauteing um, some shallots. This is quite a lot of shallots, three quarters of a cup of chopped mm -hmm. shallots, because it's really going to bring some great flavor here. So oh, it's sizzling, shallot? so we're good. Yeah. Um, sure. Why shallots over onions? Or could, could somebody You substitute? could use onions for sure. You could. I would use a sweet onion, like a sweet yellow onion, Vidalia mm -hmm. onion, um, as opposed to a white onion. Again, very subtle difference, but just the pungency of a white onion, I find isn't as nice in something that's kind of delicate like this with the mm -hmm. peas and the fresh herbs. Shallots are just they're the superior onion. I try to use shallots as much as I can, especially when doing soups like this that don't have a really long cooking time, um, as, as well as like a pasta. If you're, I, I have a recipe in the book, Easy Brussels Sprouts Pasta, and I use shallots and garlic as the base of that as well. And the sauce is just olive oil and white wine and lemon juice. So because it's so light, I just find shallots really lend a nice flavor. Mm -hmm. um, they're an important ingredient where sometimes onions, you're just really trying to cook down to get their flavor or to get out that sort of pungentness and shallots, you don't really have to do that as much. Oh. So that's why I do shallots. So I, I put the shallots in there. We're also going to do minced garlic. And this only takes about three minutes just to get it softened and cooked down. I love the smell of shallots and garlic. Oh. Just yeah. Yeah. every time someone's like, 
oh my god what are you making you're like I haven't even started I just (laughs) I just did this so that's actually a good trick too as long as you start most recipes with this type of base Mm -hmm. it's probably going to be good so I find too with soups the best thing you could do for time and your cooking order is to have everything prepped um, and not be like doing it while you're trying to cook, right? Because you do want to just make sure you don't burn the shallots and garlic and you don't want to overheat the fresh herbs. Um, so I always just advise get everything prepped before you start the cooking. And and also read the recipe all the oh way through, right? <laughs> yes, that's a good point, Ida. People don't do that. And there is a certain, you know, First of all, there's a certain organization and art to writing a cookbook that I learned the first time around. Um, Like writing recipes isn't as easy as some might think, especially like there are so many blogs. So everybody's writing recipes, but there are a lot of very poorly uh, written recipes. So that's just something to note. You should always read through to make sure just because you never know what you're getting. But it also just helps, yes, with the prep and just because cooking order does matter, you know, Mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, you can't just necessarily throw everything into a pot and cook it you know we're seeing that a lot with these one pot recipes yeah but you have to make sure like you're building flavor and that doesn't always happen by just throwing everything in with a bunch of liquid and boiling it right there's something (laughs) that happens when you are browning something right the maillard um reaction for yeah i like how you're more you're more technical than me (laughs) (laughs) but that's exactly it yes So at this stage, we've got these a little softened, a little brown, and I'm just going to put in some fresh thyme. I prefer fresh thyme and all the fresh herbs in this recipe, but as long as you have the other herbs that we're going to use fresh and you want to use dried thyme here, that's fine too. And then just salt and pepper. And this only just needs another minute or so just to get a little bit of the thyme essence to burst here. And so we're going to blend all of this and then reheat it. So you still, like I said, need to brown these things and then Mm -hmm. throw it into the blender. Don't put them in raw in here. Okay. But pretty easy. And you can just keep this pot on low heat while you do that. So I have have a question for you regarding your beautiful display of all of the ingredients. And and while you were talking about how to have all your ingredients ready, do you suggest people pre-measure everything and have them in the little bowls or... Like especially with something like this, where maybe yeah. heat and time are, are of essence, can they have it somewhere else? Yeah. Like the if salt. I was doing this myself, yes, yes, yes. This is obviously very organized and very much cooking show style. If I was doing this, just not, not for you all here, I'd be over by my stove and it would all be sitting on that butcher block. It mm-hmm. would all just be not in bowls, but all sort of just separated. So, all on the butcher block yeah okay so it would look very similar but just not in its individual bowl but it, everything's organized that's great um, yeah hint. i mean having a big cutting board and a sharp knife is very handy and that way because i do all my prep over there for every mm-hmm. dish even when i'm testing and developing recipes when i'm testing and developing i don't necessarily like do this all all this stuff but i do measure. a lot of dishes <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, I do measure, obviously, because I'm trying to come up with the amounts for people, but um, I just don't keep it all in its separate little bowls unless I need to use it later on and just kind of keep it to the side. But yes, yeah, so that's not necessary for the home cook who's just going from my book. So I've just turned the heat off because this I have a cast iron. Uh, Dutch, this is called a Dutch oven, right? Like people have La Crusade, I have a stob. These get quite hot, so you just don't want it to burn too much. So you can keep it off the heat just while we blend the rest of this. So this is how easy this comes together here. We're going to take four cups of vegetable stock and I just use stock that came in a Tetra pack. I tend to use low sodium uh, stock. So that's why I added um, salt to the onions and or the shallots and garlic. If you don't know your salt levels, you may wanna just um, add the salt at the end too, which you can do to okay. taste. But I try to make my recipes so that they're seasoned perfectly from the get-go. There are some recipes you'll find where I say salt and pepper to taste at the end, and that's usually for something like pasta where you really can't necessarily tell what everybody's gonna want. And some mm-hmm. people are trying to reduce their salt. So now we just take our thawed peas and put these in the blender. And these are already 
cooked, like the freshness of a pea, they're already bright green, they're soft. You don't need to cook them any further. It's just gonna get heated as a soup. Mm -hmm. I just like them straight like that. And then a they, can of- They do represent spring, don't they? Like yes. peas and tarragon for some reason. Oh, tarragon would actually be really good in this. Oh, okay. I should have added tarragon and I didn't. But you know what? Someone asked me the other day, what should I do with the tarragon that I bought? Because there is tarragon in a dressing recipe. Mm -hmm. And I said, just because I throw fresh herbs on all of my, like all of my meals. It doesn't matter what they are. If they're pastas, if they're salads, if they're grain bowls, if it's avocado toast. I love using fresh herbs. So tarragon wouldn't throw anything off here. You could definitely add tarragon. I'm adding parsley, dill, and mint, but you could definitely use tarragon. Um, okay, nutritional yeast I'm adding in here. Now this is just um, a tablespoon. It's not very much because I don't want this to taste like nutritional yeast, but nutritional yeast is used in a lot of vegan recipes because it's nutritionally sound, first of all, but hence its name, it's B12. It's also got iron and um, a little bit of protein, but you'd have to eat a lot of it for it to be significant <laughs> protein. But more important than its nutritional applications, it's a flavor enhancer. It is an inactive yeast that they grow on molasses, harvest it off molasses. And it's kind of like umami, it's kind of like natural MSG, uh, because it's natural glutamic acid, or glutamate. And oh. so it really is a flavor enhancer. And that's why I love using it in a lot of different recipes. And sometimes just adding a little bit helps sort of make everything pop, but it doesn't overpower the flavor. Mm -hmm. So I suggest using nutritional yeast, whether you're vegan or not. So I added a can of coconut milk, nutritional yeast, and then I did chop up my herbs because I want some of these for garnish at the end, but we're still gonna blend half of them. So you take half the dill, which is two tablespoons, and then a tablespoon of fresh mint, and then two tablespoons of fresh parsley, and then just leave a little bit there to sprinkle on at the end. And then we're gonna blend this. I'm using my smaller canister, so it's very full, but it's perfect. <laughs> Since I don't have an extension cord, I have to switch this plug. So just give me two seconds. Okay. Well, just all of those ingredients that you just mentioned are, it's making me hungry right now. It just sounds- Is your mouth like watering? All of those, yeah. The, the herbs especially for the brightness and, um, yeah, bright and the fresh. combination bright, fresh, vibrant, and um, and light. You know, we're mm -hmm. we're coming out of winter right now, and mm -hmm. we've had all these stews and heavier foods. And um, this soup sounds like it'll just uh, make you feel ready for for the spring and for the summer too. Just to get definitely. Ready for it. I'm not a fan of cold soup, but I would think you could eat this cold. Like this is one of those ones you could eat cold, but I'm just not a fan of cold soup. <laughs> personally, gazpacho. Okay, I'm gonna blend. It might be a little bit loud just for a second. Okay. You don't have to do this in such a fancy blender. I just have a Vitamix because it is an essential tool and I love it. So if you have a regular blender, it will still work because there's nothing too intense that you're trying to blend. Mm -hmm. You could also use an immersion blender. It just may not get as smooth. Um, but I think it would still suffice. It would be fine. Cause again, there's nothing too chunky happening. Okay. So we're pouring this back in. Do you have, um, a favorite appliance? Yeah, it's this blender. Uh, this was the first thing I got when I decided to go vegan because I found that there was a lot of recipes I was looking at that blended nuts like cashews into cream and I thought oh I'm getting this Vitamix because a regular like blender like a smoothie blender won't blend nuts into cream or nuts into milk um, and so I just thought this was a great investment I use it multiple times a day it does everything it's really incredible <laughs> okay Thank you. so you can get other versions of this I call it a high powered blender in the book I mm -hmm. happen to use a Vitamix but you could use Blendtec. I also suggest as a cheaper option, you can use a Magic Bullet. Um, the Magic Bullet does have the same type of blade and the same horsepower oh. to be able to blend cashews into cream. You just have to sometimes portion the recipe in half and blend half and half so because it's too small. It's much smaller, yeah. yes. Yeah, so you just wanna heat this back up so that it's warm. 
is it just to where it's warm or sorry hot. And, and not well, to or not to boil you don't want to boil it no you don't even need to bring this to a boil just okay. get it up to like just a simmer okay but essentially it's ready to eat like i said mm -hmm. but i would like my soup hot personally yeah. <laughs> i like hot soup too <laughs> yeah not a fan of yeah cold cold soup i've tried it i've tried to appreciate it but it's just not you expect it to be hot, right? So right. It's I think the only one I really like is gazpacho because normally it's like 90 degrees when I'm having it and it is refreshing. Yes. But yeah, I tried it, but I just can't, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get down with the gazpacho. There's so, always that joke. There's that joke in uh, The Simpsons. I don't know if anyone knows that joke. When Lisa goes vegetarian, which was like part of my influence for going vegetarian when I was a teenager, Lisa Simpson going vegetarian. That is such an awesome story. <laughs> yeah, and she has this this is a scene because Homer's having the barbecue where he's roasting the whole pig, and she comes over and she goes, "I brought enough gazpacho for all," and everybody's like, "Hmm." <laughs> So I think so you felt that way. <laughs> yeah, I felt that way even at the time. So I was like, okay, gazpacho, we're just not going there. Oh my gosh, I hope this heats up in time. But even if it doesn't, I mean, it looks like it does. We can, you know, it's it's TV magic, and it's I'll TV you, magic. You can say, mm, it tastes perfect. <laughs> it still does taste really, really yep. good. But I would like it to be hot. But that's okay. I'll just keep it on high and let it heat yeah. up. Well, I what? have some other questions for sure. you too. Yeah. So I mean. You you have two books, and in the first one, I, re I recall you're saying it's like you weren't even sure or you weren't comfortable writing a book because you had a blog or a vlog, and people could get all of your recipes, mm -hmm. and you, you felt that this was something, you know, that you didn't feel comfortable asking somebody to buy. I thought that was a, a really, um, well, one, sweet, super sweet, but mm -hmm. also just an interesting take on the difference between your blog and then the... Um, the book and yeah. and would love your uh, how you've come to terms with it and also mm -hmm. because you have a second book and within two years or something like that right and how yeah well it's about three yeah three years okay. since the first book came out but yes I started working on it a year after that one had come out mm -hmm. so it did seem pretty quick um, I think that this has just been such an interesting journey like me um, becoming, you know, a, a entrepreneur or like a, even a creative, a content creator or a creative person. I think it's just taken me at my own pace to really accept my, my sort of position. And also I think it's a self-worth thing. I think you, when you see the landscape of chefs and food creators, it's really intimidating. And I did have confidence out the gate that the stuff I was making was good, but only to a certain point, like blogging only has a certain perception that goes so far, but I feel like publishing becomes this other, this other world that feels really intimidating. And sometimes it, I, I can only equate it to self worth, self worthiness, right? Like just feeling like you're not good enough to put out a book because you're not an, you're not an English major. You're not somebody who spent years writing and like really honing in on a craft. So you feel like you don't, you don't have any right to really do that. I would say a lot of those types of thoughts were part of my limiting of myself in saying like, I don't think I want to make a book or I don't think that's the right thing for me to do because I live in this digital space and I should probably think of something new and innovative, not, not sort of this antiquated publishing um, path, which is, was what my perception as well. Like I just wasn't sure if people really bought cookbooks anymore. Um, and I've surprised myself from the very beginning of all of this. I mean, I never thought I'd have a blog that I could monetize. I never thought I could have hundreds of thousands of people following me on social media. I never thought I could write a word grammatically correct, like a sentence grammatically correctly. So how could I ever publish a book? Uh, I never thought I would pick up a camera because when I worked in television, um, they were always trying to encourage me to like pick up the, we used to, I'm, I'm older. So like the cameras we were using were beta cams or uh, mini DV cams, like very technical cameras that you have to go to school for. So I was always like, 
no, I'm not going to shoot my own content. I'm not going to shoot. I'm just going to host and produce and like, leave me alone. But as things evolved, the cameras, DSLR cameras, and, and I use a Canon DSLR, but like that was something I taught myself. And because it was so much um, easier to learn and they were so much consu- much more consumer friendly, right? Mm-hmm. Um, things changed and I adapted. But that's like all these little sort of steps along the way. Um just always seemed out of the realm of possibility. But as those opportunities would come up, I would sort of just dive in. And and that's the amazing freedom you get with kind of running your own online business. Um, and I guess attributes to the success I've had because I haven't been scared to kind of do these things. But I always have waited till the right moment till I was sort of like ready to like walk through that door. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Well, it definitely was the right moment for you for for the book as well. I mean, not just your your blog, but um, the book as well. And we're all very lucky to have that uh, Thank you. book as a reference. And um, I do know that there are a lot of people, those that I work with, who have said that they've been able to trick their partners into eating vegan food without That's their knowing, well. like you had mentioned earlier. Yeah. That's what I want people to do. Just make good food that happens to be plant-based and you can just talk about it after talk about it once the person's very interested in what it was like and ooh, what did you make this with and then you can reveal your secrets <laughs> right well speaking of secrets um and in, i think there's like this one secret ingredient that i noticed in the second book for the um kala namak the black salt yes did anyone notice that i didn't plug in the stove <laughs> Because remember I said I had to switch outlets? <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm like, hmm, there's no steam coming from this. Okay. I could have just ignored that I did that, but I thought I would tell you because I make mistakes all the time. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Let's start that. Well, you know, it is Google and there probably will be an engineer who would have noticed that and saying, how did it get hot if she didn't change the outlet? <laughs> right? So. right? Oh, my God. Sorry for interrupting. I just thought that was funny. No problem. No problem. <laughs> uh, but, um, yeah, back to that black salt. It wasn't yeah. – I, I scoured all of the, the recipes in the first book, never saw it. And then I, I see a lot in this new book. So – it must be a new ingredient. It feels like it's kind of like a secret ingredient in that it's not well known. Um, no. How did you come upon this ingredient and um, what does it bring to your food? Well, I would say that I discovered Colin de Mock after I had already made those recipes in Vegan Comfort Classics. So I had started using it, but I couldn't go back and add it to the book because the book is already printed or you know, being printed. So I sort of discovered it in that time once the manuscript was handed in and the recipes were already finished. I, I, I think I just heard about it from the general vegan community, even possibly my friend uh, Timothy, who does the same thing as me. He goes by Mississippi Vegan. I think he might have introduced it to me. And so traditionally, it comes from um, Indian cooking, like put it in curries and things like that. But it has this uh it's yeah black himalayan salt and it has a sulfur quality um so we know how overpowering the smell of sulfur can be but that really is sort of the sulfur essence of eggs when you smell eggs cooking that's what that is and so the colin amok um i think was just kind of embraced by the vegan community in order to add that eggy flavor to things that we are trying to create that are supposed to mimic eggs so at its simplest use, you can throw it into your tofu scramble, or I have a mung bean scramble as well in the new book, just to give it a hit at the end. You don't want to heat it too much because then it loses that essence. But if you add it in like the black salt to taste at the end, you'll just get a very subtle sulfur essence and it just sort of lends itself. It gives it sodium too. It gives it a salty taste, but it also kind of gives it that eggy quality. Awesome. I, I did buy some. I haven't used it. Um, I'm very excited to, to try that, so thank you. Don't be afraid to use it just even as your salt. Um, like if you're making a dressing or something, um, like olive oil, Dijon, nutritional yeast, black salt, and pepper, just okay. to kind of, it just gives it so, this sort of extra savoriness. So I think it's just, one again, one of those things you gotta just try, try. different uses as opposed to just reaching for the table salt and uh, see how you like it. And you only need a little bit. Okay. I'll be yeah. uh, judicious in how I use yeah. it. Yeah. 
<laughs> so now that you have your soup plugged in, I know you're going to be plating it. We're plugged. We can plate Since it. It's probably not that as hot as I would like it, but let's plate it so I can show you the leveled up version, right? Because okay. we're getting close to our time. So you would just, yes, get this to a low simmer, but you don't need to overheat it because you want it to stay bright green too, right? If you were to really heat this and cook it down too much, it would start getting a little muddled looking. I'd get that so you, army green color that you wanted yeah. to avoid, right? Yeah, I like the fresher, bright color. And that's my rule of thumb for basically all greens in general. Whenever you're cooking anything green, that's why cooking order is important. Because if you add it in at the beginning with the onion sauteing, you're going to overcook your broccoli or overcook your Brussels or something like this. And you always want to have them be, I guess, kind of al dente, like kind of crisp. Mm -hmm. And they turn from their raw green color to this very vibrant green color. And that's when you want to eat them. Once they sit in the pan, right, as leftovers, they get a bit yellowy. And yeah. to me, that's not always the greatest. No, not very appetizing. Greens. So for this one. Oh, see, I just need a little spoon for just the green pea soup on its own. I've gone ahead and I've made, oh, you know what? We forgot to add the lemon juice because I oh. was yakking away. Again, lemon juice isn't something you want to overheat too. So once it comes to that simmer, turn the heat off, stir in the lemon juice. And that, again, the lem just that little hit of lemon kind of brings out, um, again, the herbs, the freshness. Again, balancing it out with just a little bit of acidity. It's okay that that one doesn't have. I'll just put a couple drops there. <laughs> Can you see that? Let me bring it over. Um, yeah, bring it. Perfect. Just a little in. And then I went ahead and made, this is from the book too, Old Bay Croutons, which I know you made, Ida, right? Yes. And ate up very quickly because they're delicious on their own. <laughs> yeah, just like with a dip or hummus or something. But I love putting big, chunky croutons. So I cut big chunks or I tear big chunks of the baguette instead of cutting little tiny squares. And then um, those are gonna go on top and they're gonna soak up nicely. If you want, this is optional, but I like a little bit of plain vegan yogurt, just to add a little cooling element here. You can swirl that on the top. Now I have a question. You had said that um, vegan products that you can find in the grocery store now have come a long way from the first yes. book to the second book. Um, and I noticed that there are like, references to the vegan cheese and Parmesan. And in the first book, you have the, the parm, right? Yeah, I make my own You parm. make your own parm, and then you have like your own sour cream. Which do you prefer? Do you think that having the, the store-bought ones in the refrigerator are good? Or is it better to, you know, get both books and make the, the homemade yeah. version? Honestly, it's like split down the middle for me. As somebody who cooks a lot and makes a lot of recipes, sometimes I'm looking to cut corners too, right? In this case, um, you know, I happen to have the plain vegan yogurt already because I'm eating that in the morning. So I just put that on here. But you could very well have my uh, cashew sour cream made from you know, a couple of days before from another recipe, and you could definitely use that here. I think there are some people who like making things from scratch because then they know the ingredients or maybe they're trying to eat less packaged food. So I think I've now offered between both books, both options. But I think we shouldn't shame people or shy away from using these store-bought products now because they are just so good. And the companies are being very mindful of the ingredients they're using, right? You're finding palm oil free, uh, refined sugar free, non-GMO and I feel like a, like most of the products are very high quality and the ingredient lists have been um, mindfully thought about so I don't think we should feel bad about using them you know here and right. there especially the cheeses I mean I missed cheese obviously when I went <laughs> vegan and then for so long you couldn't really get good vegan cheese at the grocery store other than like fermented cashew cheeses which have always kind of been around and pretty pretty good mm -hmm. um but now you can get things for grilled cheese, which is why I included the grilled cheese variations in my book, because that's something I eat all the time because I just love grilled cheese. And you can re now get really good sliced vegan cheese that's tangy and, and, and um, you know, strong tasting. So mm -hmm. I just want to I also just want to support that because I think the more we support that, the more we're going to get in the grocery store. And you can see it's like taking over the grocery store, like the non-dairy yeah. milk alternative aisle is 
I think just as big, if not bigger than the dairy case, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it so really positive. has grown quite a bit. Yes. I'm just adding, I added the croutons and then you just want to just garnish with some fresh herbs that you have left over as well. So that's the green pea soup. And it looks just like the book. So people. It does look just, just like the book. <laughs> yeah. It's not style. I mean, it's not so styled that you can't do it yourself. And we just watched no, Lauren do and it. And that's another thing about a cookbook. You think, oh, all this food styling tricks. I would like to just mention that I don't do that. Um, I really shoot the food for real. And I don't stuff paper towels under things. And there's a lot of tricks yeah. that food stylists use. And I just don't do them. I try to just sh show the food the way it really is. Um, Again, to make it achievable, to make it realistic. And if your food, it doesn't, it doesn't look exactly like mine, it's not a big deal. It's still going to taste good. Oh, I just wanted to show the picture. Yeah. yeah. See, look at that. So it looks just, I mean, literally <laughs> looks exactly the same. So, so now awesome. I'm just going to show you, this is the leveled up. So this is what you were talking about. It says level up in the corner. This is just another way to eat some leftover green pea soup because, uh, again, you may just want to like beef it up a little bit, right? Or make it a little bit heartier. So that's what I've done here. So you want me to go ahead and that now be, we've got that nice hot soup. So <laughs> in fact, I just actually want to taste it now that it's hot myself. Yeah. Yep. That's Delish. the right temp. Okay. <laughs> That's the right temp where you can still put it in your mouth and just you have to blow on it a little bit. So I'm just using a bigger shallow bowl here. Now, I'm going to do it this way because I'm just making a single serving, but you could put everything right into the hot soup in the pot. Oh, okay. so all we're going to do, and again, you could have cooked this pasta in advance. Let's say you made the bacon kale pasta from the book. Maybe you boiled a little bit of extra and reserved it, the rotini pasta that I used. Mm -hmm. um, or you can just cook up some rotini while you're heating that up. Um, I would probably just nuke this in the microwave or like I said, put it directly in the hot soup in the pot just to get it warmed up a bit. And so I just, you know, like when you eat minestrone, I just love having pasta in yeah. like a, a broth. There's just something cozy about that. So we put rotini in, we put some more fresh peas. So now you've got whole peas to eat in here, which I like. And if you wanted to do that in the other version, you could do mm -hmm. that as well. So texturally, you've already got like some yeah. really like the peas pop and then you have the bite of your pasta. I love I'm a, here. I don't know. People have like varying opinions on soup. As you can see, my soup is quite brothy, right? It's not a puree. I'm not a big fan of like baby food puree soup. It's just not appealing to me. So I made it thin i call it a thin soup <laughs> then you get the texture from the croutons right right here we've got a thin brothy soup but then we're adding more texture and bite um so that's what i prefer to do over... but if somebody perhaps likes the thicker like bisque like soup they could just reduce yeah. the, the stock you, that you have in. you could reduce it you could also go ahead and add um like there's a few things you could do. You could add mashed potato. You could blend cooked oh. potato into that blender. Mm -hmm. um, so, or even just boil chunks of potatoes and then blend them in with the, the way I blended everything. That'll yep. help thicken it. Uh, even potato starch or potato flakes, instant potato flakes would work for that. You oh, could even, if you wanted, and this is, this is how I think of like this idea of leveling up, right? Let's say you had my leftover cashew sour cream and you had, you know, half a cup of it, stir it right into the soup. And that'll help thicken it too, if you want it to be thicker or even creamier. Mm -hmm. So cashews are a good thickener. Okay, I've added arugula, which is really nice and fresh and peppery and I love it. And then again, you could use the same herbs, but for this level up, I did some fresh basil instead. And vegan Parmesan. So this is one of my favorite uh, new vegan cheese products. It's from Violife and it's exactly like Parm. Well, I shouldn't say exactly, but it's very sharp. Okay. It's the closest we've ever come to a vegan Parm block. That's like, I mean, look at it. It looks like the kind it they looks... grate on your pasta at the restaurant. So now, I hand grated it, this. Does it melt like regular 
caramel. Yes, it kind of does that crisp, like, you know, like how parm gets a little crispy when you heat it. Mm -hmm. It's like the same. Yeah, this oh, is wow. made out of potato starch and uh, coconut oil, and it's quite lovely. So I did parm and then pepper, pepper on here. I love your that pepper is, mill. <laughs> it's, elect it's an electric, electric pepper mill. I love it too. So that's, that's the alternate version of doing this. So again, you don't, you could make this straight away. You don't have to make the plain version with mm -hmm. the croutons or mix and match whatever you want. But um, I have to say like, usually when I'm cooking pasta, I always end up having some leftovers and I just keep them aside for things like this. Um, Cause I used to do that even if I would buy like a can of soup, never has enough stuff in it. So I would always add my own beans or my own pasta to it. <laughs> so kind of that's where I got this idea from. That's great. I mean, it's especially in our new environment of working from home, yeah. it's uh it's ha having a whole new meal uh, ready for you with yeah, very little time. I just don't time. like reheating the same thing over and over again. Like that's just, that's just my ethos. So I'm oh. hoping that people get on board with kind of experimenting that way themselves. Well, you gave us even more ideas with like the sour cashew yeah. sour cream and, and other ways of, of um, just this one recipe. So that's great. Um, we have a few questions yes. from our audience. So I'd love to be able to ask you um, those questions and not take up all of all of the time. Oh, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So I think they're going to be. So Wenchen Lee asks, thank you for joining us, Lauren. Love your Vegan Comforts classic cookbook. Love the mac and cheese and the Parmesan recipes. What do you think about all of the plant-based meat in hitting the market? <laughs> meat, yeah. Yes, um, <laughs> in quotation marks. I think it's wonderful. And, you know, the fact that we're seeing these products being sold right alongside the meat is also wonderful. I fully support that um, because again, it's it's normalizing it, right? Uh, Ethan, who is the CEO of Beyond Meat, I saw a quote recently that he said, uh, I may not get this exactly word for word, but it was along the lines of like, we're at a point in time where it's not a decision of whether or not to eat meat, but whether to eat meat made from animals or plants. And I think that's just poignant and perfect and exactly the direction we're heading in is that you can now, we can all confidently say like as a vegan who grew up without Beyond Meat for many years, cause it's only entered the market in the last, even since I put out Vegan Comfort Classics, yeah. it wasn't even available. You know, it's like, it's true. It's like we can eat plant meat and they've, they've revolutionized, you know, the science and the food tech behind that to make it equal, if not superior, to the actual construct of what real meat is. You can hear the CEO of Beyond Meat talk about, it's the same combination of amino acids and lipids. It's exactly structurally, molecularly, just like meat, but made from plant fibers. And so I just think that's so cool and I fully support all of that. And then of course, you'll always see knockoffs coming into the market and not all meat, you know, not all plant meats created equal. There's definitely pr better products than others. Um, but I try to make as many authentic recommendations as I can through my channels because um, I, I'm not being paid by the brands, but I just want to support the ones that are really good because I just really appreciate the ingenuity that's going on, you know, and we do have to vote with our credit card. Mm -hmm. So the price will come down when the demand goes up. And we're already seeing that shift. The prices has gone down on Beyond Meat, the grocery store, as well as the distribution of it is so much more widely available. So yeah, I, I buy all the things and I eat Yeah, and, them. and I also really appreciate your your uh, testing, your your um, series on testing the food and tasting yeah. it. It's really fun to watch and gives me a better insight as to what I should be buying myself. Yeah, because so. now it's getting to the point where we have we have like five or six different vegan or plant based ground meat products. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, they're not all the same. <laughs> <laughs> no. And it, it goes back to what you're saying, anything you can eat, I can eat better and vegan, right? Because with those plant based meats, um, the the recipe options of creating almost what you think you're going to miss. Um, yeah, goes away. 
Well, and I think this purism that veganism kind of came from back in the day, like that's gone, which I, which I like meaning no, you know, I love meat. Nobody's saying they don't like meat, but now that we are aware of the, um, how problematic the food system is and the environmental issues, especially in light of the pandemic and all of these things, the climate, um, it is a question of just what kind of meat are you going to eat? And I think there's a big part of the vegan community that gets a little hung up on, but why would you want to eat meat or something that tastes like meat? But like the, the future of veganism is meat eaters eating plant meat, not pure, this pure, like only eating lentils and tofu type of veganism. Like it needs to be well-rounded, I think, in order to be sustainable and appealing to people. Yeah, uh, agreed. Yeah. So do we have another question? I think we had a couple. If not, I have more of my own. Um, from Cody Smith. Uh, Thanks for doing this talk, Lauren. I was wondering how you plan your shopping. Do you make a menu each week or just get staples and then figure out the rest? Some combination? Yes. Um, I always appreciate questions like this, except I'm the worst person to give you advice because of the nature of my job. I'm kind of at the whim of my creations and my art or my content. So it's like, what recipes am I sharing with you guys to make your lives easier? And yes, I think about your shopping, but for me, I'm all over the place. Like one day I'm making one recipe, the next day I'm making something totally different. Um, and so I never get to meal plan for me. I never get to think about truly, what do I want to (laughs) eat? I just eat what I have left. Like today I'll eat this because I have this year. Um, but I guess if I was, I, you know, I haven't gone grocery shopping where it isn't with my work in mind ever, almost ever. Um, so you do need to build up a, a pantry of staples for sure because there are things you can have in there that will last forever like canned lentils canned fire roasted tomatoes canned pumpkin um nutritional yeast some raw cashews some almonds some walnuts the spices and kind of like get to that point where you've got these things that are relatively you know they don't go bad quickly and they're always there for you to reach for and then making sure you buy um planning the meals you want to eat so that you don't buy too much produce that you're not going to eat right i think if you're just starting out that's probably my best advice don't just go buy any and all vegetables thinking you're going to eat them (laughs) (laughs) unless you're really good at leveling up and repurposing and reusing because um i i don't like to encourage obviously food waste right so i usually get a bunch of kale a couple of fresh herbs um and then something that you know you're going to use, like a head of cauliflower. So, you know, maybe you're going to make one or two cauliflower recipes that week and just start with that and then use up the rest of the bits after, right, for other things. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that helps answer that question. But, yeah, I'm just all over the place because I have to think about, like, my job first or, like, what am I making for work first? Right. But I think yeah. um, uh, your newest book actually helps with that kind of planning ahead because you can make – you can plan on three different recipes and then you level up and, and purchase by, you know, for that. And they're, they're so almost mix and match in some way. Yes. So you're actually right. And I did that on purpose. Like, yeah, when you're going through the book, looking for inspiration, hone in on, yeah, like one of the lunches and one of the dinners. And from there, you're going to get six or seven meals just from those two recipes. Um, plus I've got the, what you need at the front of the book, which just lists every single thing that is used in the book ingredient wise, and it's categorized based on how you'll find it in the grocery store. So it doesn't mean you need to go buy all that stuff at once. It just means at least you have kind of a reference list of the things that are used throughout this book. And eventually you'll end up being pretty well stocked as you go along. Cool. Uh, well, I have a question for you. What was the mm-hmm. hardest recipe for you to develop? Mm, good question. What was the hardest? There's some um, there's some behind the scenes uh, vlogs on Hot for Foods YouTube channel right now showing some of my testing, mm-hmm. really showing the raw behind the scenes of me getting frustrated uh, and trying to figure out a recipe and really showing the amount of work that does go into it. 
Um, I mean, one of those recipes in the video is, and this seems simple, but I was overthinking it. The chocolate peanut butter crispy cake. Mm -hmm. Seems simple, right? <laughs> But it's a crispy cake without marshmallows. So you're trying to find that right stickiness plus the right balance of sweetness. And desserts are notoriously hard because you're not necessarily able to taste as you go. With baking, although this is a no-bake recipe, you still have to make the whole thing and then eat it. You can't be really tasting it as you're going to know what the end result's gonna be like. Or when you're baking, you have to bake the thing for 30 <laughs> minutes or a loaf cake for 50 minutes and you're just like praying that it works because then you have to do it all over again if it doesn't, right? Right. Um, so baking can be one of the trickier things. And this one I did make four times because, four or five times because I didn't know if I should use uh, maple syrup or not. And I started using brown rice syrup and corn syrup and all these. And I was like, I don't want to use corn syrup. Um, and so it was just trying to find the right combination of sweeteners and things to make it the right texture, make it the right sweetness. So that one caused me some trouble. And plus, I was trying to recreate something I had eaten at a bakery that I really love. And because I had that in my mind and I wasn't getting it exactly because they use corn syrup. Uh, I had to let go and say, okay, this is my version. It's not going to be exactly the same because I don't want to use powdered sugar and corn syrup. Right. But that's why theirs tastes so good because it's really <laughs> got the bad sugars in there. <laughs> but yours is a healthier version. Healthier, I think we, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's relative. Um, yeah. And I think we have one more question from Sean. Um, hi, Lauren. Love your videos been a big fan for several years. I love to cook, but always struggle with ideas for quick weekday lunches while working from home. What are some of your go-tos? Well, my go-tos are definitely in this book <laughs> because I put the easiest thing I could ever put in a cookbook. One was a smoothie. I know that's not lunch, but it's a pretty hearty smoothie that'll take you from breakfast to lunch. It's my fave smoothie. It's got a lot of superfoods in it, filling things. Um, so I like that. I think, I mean, this soup or the other soups in there are great because you may want to just make them on a Sunday, but you know, they're going to last throughout the week. Um, and then this sandwich, I call it my everyday sandwich. And this uses store-bought vegan cheese, store-bought deli slices, store-bought vegan mayonnaise. It's just a sandwich, but it's so good. And I just wanted to share, like, this is literally what I eat every day almost every day, sometimes twice a day. Sometimes I eat it for breakfast because I'm starving when I wake up and I just want to eat a sandwich. I love sandwiches. So uh, this is a really good one. And find some deli slices that you like. I like Tofurky. I also like this brand Unreal Deli that um, you can only get in the US right now. Um, so that's a good one. And then I always make, and that's why they all are called this, my everyday roasted vegetable salad. I massage some kale and then I, roast vegetables so usually potato if anything just do put roasted potatoes which is similar to the fries and salad this um, i love that recipe <laughs> and this is a joke because we're vegans are always stuck eating fries and salad everywhere we go out to eat because there's no options but i actually love fries and salad and i love roasted potatoes on salad i love eating like fresh cold raw vegetables with hot vegetables on top. I think, again, that's like a textural thing and sort of an experience that's, again, very cozy. So roast up some veg, throw it on your salad with whatever you want. I mean, this is just an example of a, of a nice combination of currants, pumpkin seeds, hemp hearts, some shredded cabbage. But you could also pull from the bowl Bible and uh, make one of the dressings from there. Or um, again, something like the crunchy butter beans, like you could roast potatoes and beans at the same time potentially, and just have, again, all these textures on your salad. That's what makes a bowl very interesting and mm -hmm. filling is if you have a variety of things on it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you for all those great ideas. I, I think I have lunch ready for the next 462 <laughs> days. <laughs> For my future i and gotta start saying that in the media now thank <laughs> you for that thank you for that statistic you're very welcome um and thank you for the bowl bible it's going to be a, a repertoire in our family thank so you. i want to thank you for joining us today Oops. and um encourage everybody to get both of these amazing books 
don't tell anybody you're you're serving them vegan food and let them figure it out <laughs> themselves because uh, they probably won't even know the difference. It's just make just sure they're not delicious. allergic to nuts. <laughs> yeah. That, that's a good point. <laughs> that's a good but, point. Just make sure no one's allergic to nuts. I find yeah. that comes up quite a bit and you're okay. All right. Well, thank you again. And Thanks, um, Ida. We'll see you soon. Yeah, Bye. this was so fun. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye.